Now there is, just, just to continue on with this last um, subject I was on, there is additional discussion in notes and queries where they go back and forth on their opinion as to what, you know, the, who's, co you know, of the monuments in the Exeter Cathedral that, where all the paint had dropped off and there's just two gray statues sitting in the cathedral and, you know, 1800, uh, <laughs> they're discussing, you know, are, are these, you know, who are in these tombstones? Is it a Chichester? Is it a, a Raleigh in there? And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's, there, there is a debate. I, I, in my own mind, I don't think the, um, the debate's really settled. He isn't going back far enough. And the, and the records going earlier in 1500, as far as I know, probably just don't exist. So, <laughs> go ahead. I mean, anybody compiling a record, no matter who, who good they are, going back 200 years, uh, in a day and age without computers and only pins to write with, who knows? Who knows? Now I'll do a discussion on visitations and how they are helpful sometimes in pretty much medieval genealogy. To get anywhere in medieval genealogy, you need a combination of things. And I guess I'm a bit out of bounds by saying the 1500s are medieval. Um, nonetheless, you know, the recording of births, marriages, and deaths really didn't start until... Uh, sometime in the 1500s. Um, they started in America, Massachusetts in the early 1600s before the, um, you know, the, the original, some of the original immigrants probably slipped through the cracks as far as, you know, besides the group of the Mayflower that they, they studied back and forth and Bradford did a good job of journaling who was there, but the next wave of individuals between them and when they finally started recording births, marriages, and deaths, and deeds at the county level, there's about a 10-year period maybe where people could have come in and just not really been discovered. Um, nonetheless, they would have had to die out, so it doesn't gonna affect anybody to this day. But uh, anyway, so if the records aren't destroyed either by World War II or um, fires or, or things of that nature, natural disasters or, or acts of war, uh, anybody of English heritage um, theoretically should be able to find birth, marriage, and death records dating to the mid-1500s uh, from anywhere. It's just a matter of making that connection. And the problem we have right now, the biggest the biggest barrier to to progress in genealogical research is copyright, and that's a whole different, a whole other subject. Now, because people have last names have are more common than not, um, you know, last names don't change at every generation. Families grow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can't just merely rely on birth, marriage, and death records alone. Uh, for the most part, you can, everybody knows, the, <laughs> almost everybody that's been through high school in America knows that the population of this country has pretty much migrated from the 13 colonies on the coast all the way over to California. And there, depending on what state you lived in, uh, you know, civil recording of births, marriages, and deaths weren't really prescribed in some states for until quite late. My own grandfather, born in 1905, actually I'm not even sure if it's 03, 04, or 05, you know, the day but not the year, in Florida, you know, as I said earlier, had to have his sister uh, write an affidavit and my grandpa notarized it himself. That shouldn't have been allowed. But uh, anyway, to say when he was born and who his parents were, well, I have from family records and other documents that I know who his, you know, who his father, parents were. It doesn't really disprove it or make the record of that less of a quality. But I'm beginning into medieval genealogy. Um, there's going to be a lot of families with the same last name in the country. Just to give you an example here, I've got a 
little booklet that was available at a very good source at BYU that you, th these these microfilm books aren't going to come up when you do a Google search. You have to do a search in the BYU library system in their archives, and then you can find like this book. This is called a, a Pratt Family Miscellany, and there's just so many. This uh, you know, Hurlsboro, Stockton, Flatwell, you know, and and out of all the you know 100 plus pages in that pamphlet alone there's only about three or four pages of content that I after looking it over pretty intensely see it even has anything to do with the Pratt family that I'm concerned with that interacted with Dr. Uh, Charles Morton <clears throat> so it's a combination really of knowing their geographic location knowing the circumstances of their lives if they change their geographic location, um, being able to read a will of a parent bequesting things to a daughter, and then identifying marriages to siblings and looking at siblings' wills and aunts and uncles' wills, all those different things, and, and getting the whole the feel for the whole generation really to be able to really kind of move up uh, the scale. That's the only real way to know you've got things right, uh, both analytically and with sufficient competent evidence. And um, so the visitations are one part of the piece of that formula. The way Drake approaches his work, uh, and I think he's done a very good job, not only has he gone into the various parishes and had the, the vicars of the time extract uh, parish record entries and record them, and he put them in his book, but he also got wills, funeral certificates, and Harold's visitations. And putting all those different things together, he's been able to put together a pretty substantiated account. Now, I will say um, one thing. Uh, the visitations are, you know, there could, I'm, certain, I'm sure there could be portions of the visitations that have errors. But there's one part that I looked at, uh, Trichester Woodworthy, uh, there's an entry for the children of William and Susanna, and uh, the list of children uh, matches exactly in exact order of the children that were born uh, and baptized at the Woodworthy Parish of the generation of which William and James eventually ended up going to America. Um, there's no there's no burial entry for those individuals now, but the will doesn't say anything. Uh, the oldest brother's name was Hugh, and his will doesn't say anything about anybody actually living in America. But he does mention his younger brother, William. Okay, so, okay, now let's just look a little bit here. How do these coats of arms differ? Now, uh, Chichester Woodworthy, which, which I almost no doubt come from, um, <coughs> they they quarter their arms, and the first and fourth quarter is Chichester. Check and her goals at Chief Fair, and the second and third is Raleigh's. Is second and third is Raleigh, goals of Ben Ver between six crosslets. Now, had the Chichesters dropped their arms in favor of Raleigh, they wouldn't need to quarter their arms with Raleigh because that's what quartering's for to add. The arm, the, a different set of arms into the family with a little bit of a unique variation to differentiate one portion of the family from the other. Now here is, you know, they got the Chichester of Arlington, and they've got the first, first and fourth is Chichester, but they have Raleigh on the second quarter, but then on the third quarter they have one because. Uh, Mice Chichester, one of his ancestors, married Alice Watton. And I was actually kind of surprised at that because um, I guess I could look at my records, but um, no, I shouldn't say I'm surprised at that. I don't, I don't, rec I don't have enough recollection. And then there's a monument at, at uh, Pilton Church for um, Sir John Chichester. And he quarters at ten ways, so the quarter isn't limited to four. He's got Chichester, Raleigh, Proust, Moyle, Watton, Diamond, Beaumont, Stockhay, Willington, and Wise. 
Now, even though he's got those things quartered in there, the level of written documentation proof that um, Drake here was able to look at is really limited to Chichester, Raleigh, and I think that's about it. So anyway, and then he goes a little bit into some of the history of these various families, but at the end of the day, you can't just say, okay, I've got, I've quartered my arms with Dymoke, so I must be a descendant of this specific individual that was Dymoke. Well, yeah, yes in a way, no in a way, because if there's, if there's only one branch of the Dymoke family, the original you know, original arms grantor, you could probably say, yeah, I'm, I'm a descendant of, but um, as to which branch you descend from, if there was more than one brother or sister all the way down the line, you, you can't say. So that's what, that's what, um, that's what he's talking about here. But uh, part of the way, you can, really, forensically, you can if all the rules are followed and the heralds never make a mistake and the arms bearers never make a mistake, then um, forensically, in theory, you'd be able to, to sort some things out. If at every single stage an arms bearing quartering was added to your, to your coat, every mom has another thing to add. I'm going to stop there for now and then I'll continue.